Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Glenn Zeitz. He is a trial lawyer with a long and well-earned reputation as one of the best in the state of New Jersey, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the federal court in that region. He's been at it a long time and tried scores of cases, including one where he defended a woman whose house was threatened by eminent domain, ultimately to make the property accessible to parking for a Trump casino. That means Glenn Zeitz has deposed Donald J. Trump. In the end, his client got to keep her house. His career has been riddled with the cast of characters who might find themselves in trouble in that neck of the woods, to include organized crime figures and casino operators from Atlantic City to Philadelphia. Joining Pete on this episode as his co-host is our dear friend, best-selling author Jim DeFelice, who knows just how to draw the narrative out of a guy. Jim and Glenn are friends, so the witty repartee ensues. Now, I want to take a second to invite you to support our favorite cause, Save the Brave. You can read about them at savethebrave.org. They are a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. Read all about them, donate a few bucks to help them help some veterans who can use a hand. Again, it's savethebrave.org. Pete and I both support Save the Brave with our time and with recurring contributions right out of our PayPal accounts. Scott Husing supports them too. He serves on their board. They do great work. And we urge you to support them as well. And if you would buy a combat veteran a lunch once a month, come on, you'd do that. That's all we're asking. And you can set up a recurring PayPal contribution, again, right at savethebrave.org. You should do it. We'd also like you to support the Break It Down show on whatever platform you're listening to us. iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube. Please help us out. With a five-star rating and a positive review, you'll help new listeners find us, and we really appreciate you doing it, and we appreciate you listening. And you can rate us and review us while you're listening, which is a hell of a lot easier than executing a legal defense in federal court. Speaking of which, you're going to love our guest today. Joining Pete and Jim DeFelice, here is Glenn Zeitz. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> All right, this is Glenn Zeitz, and I'm on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is great. So this show was co-produced with myself and, of course, Jim DeFelice, New York Times' number one best-selling author, who's done this a number of times with me and also been a guest on the show. And he said, hey, we got to get Glenn on because Glenn's got an incredible story. Um, we've been on fire with these things, Glenn. We had on the team that figured out who D.B. Cooper was. And they uh, they took the uh, – his name was uh, Rackstraw was his last name, Rick, Robert Rackstraw. And they took the uh, link analysis chart and showed it to him, and he basically said, I'll be damned. You got it right. <laughs> so, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got these incredible people from that era of time who we've always wondered who did what and what kind of people they were. But your story and your connections to Frank Sheeran are, are just incredible and very similar. But I guess as his lawyer, you've got real insight as to what he did and didn't do. Well, I think that's the uh, best way to describe it. I know what he did and I know what he didn't do. And uh, I guess the best way to put it is that I met uh, Frank initially, would have been in January of 1980. And Frank uh, had been indicted at that time in a racketeering case in Philadelphia. And he was indicted with a co-defendant who hired me to represent him. His name was Lou Batone or Lou Buttons. So what happened is they were indicted in a uh, like a 20 page extensive racketeering uh, case <clears throat> and the backdrop of the case uh, clearly was the Hoffa disappearance. So I knew going into this as a young lawyer, because I was about 32 at the time, I'd been a lawyer for seven years, but I already managed to do a lot of things to get to a certain point, even though I was not an accomp- a really accomplished lawyer, but I was on my way up. And uh, what happened is I remember I walked into the courtroom and I met Frank and he was represented by Emma Fitzpatrick at the time. 
And the best way I could describe uh, Frank is using maybe more current day analogies. If you ever saw the Roseanne show and you saw Dan Connor, her husband, John Goodman? Yeah. That was, that was pretty much what Frank looked like because Frank was about where he is six foot four, about 250. Uh, he had hands like uh, bear paws and uh, was, you know, big guy, very gregarious. And uh, I walk into the courtroom and I see Emmett, who I had known, and I see uh, Frank, and I already knew Lou, obviously. And he comes up to me and goes, hey, Goomba, how you doing? You know, I said, I'm doing, you know. So uh, that was let's my introduction. Set, you know what? Let's set the scene a little bit more because a lot of the people that are going to be listening to uh, you know, to the podcast, some of them may know who Jimmy Hoffa was or is that they don't they but they're not really going to understand how important uh, how big this case was Hoffa's disappearance Hoffa Jimmy Hoffa at the time was kind of had the status somewhere between you know uh, the most popular politician and the most popular let's see rock star or, or sports figure or something it was very very huge in the public and he had gone to jail and then he was, had gotten out of jail and uh, was looking to get back into the Teamsters, uh, which he had headed for years. All of a sudden, he disappears. And that's the first thing we know about it. And uh, as we're reading all the, the newspapers and things. And so and that really is where you kind of make your entrance, Glenn, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty much it. To give you a little bit of the backdrop of that. There was a point in time when Jimmy Hoffa, because he was the head of the Teamsters, where he literally could shut down the entire country if he wanted to by calling a nationwide strike. Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to SaveTheBrave.org. Click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. There was a point in time with Jimmy Hoffa, because he was the head of the Teamsters, where he literally could shut down the entire country if he wanted to by calling a nationwide strike. And he had, in in some ways, you could compare him with the, the power that he had as the president almost, because he operated on a national level. Uh, he was extremely well known by everybody. He was pretty much either either liked, feared, however you want to characterize it. And there was a lot of animosity and animus that had existed between Hoffa and the Kennedys. And the backdrop, uh, very briefly, was the following: uh, when uh, John Kennedy ran against Nixon, Kennedy's father, it was rumored, had a connection to Cook County in Illinois, and the Daly, who was the mayor, and the word was. After the election, it was a close election, a close election that Kennedy won. That it was Cook County to put him over the top, and that it was Kennedy and connections with he, that he had behind the scenes, the father with the mob, that the mob was sort of looking forward to Kennedy becoming the president. And then what happened is he appointed his brother Bobby as the attorney general. Uh, what then ended up happening is they had hearings, and Hoffa ended up being persecuted if you want to call it prosecuted you know glenn uh, i gotta i gotta stop you there buddy because you're following the plot line from the irishman and and you know i gotta tell you i had uh, you and i saw that movie not too long ago and we were lucky enough to get in on a preview and i had i have a lot of problems with the history of that movie the, the history that they portray and 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 things and um i just have a lot of problems uh, with that film what was your impression of it because the film is about frank sheeran and it's about this period and it, and it's about uh these murders I and mean, what was your impression of the movie of the movie itself well i guess the best way to put it uh, put it is that with regard to the movie itself i thought the acting was great uh-huh. i thought it was very entertaining I thought the performances were, were very interesting, uh, including uh, De Niro. Uh, now, De Niro played uh, Frank. Uh, I thought it was a little funny for me because Frank, you know, being a big Irishman, uh, like I mentioned, and De Niro was playing him. But, I mean, I viewed it from the standpoint of it, it's an adaptation. You know, this is a movie, the way, way I understood it or way it was presented is it's an adaptation of a book. And the book itself is supposed to be nonfiction, but the movie itself, you know, is what it is. What's the name of the book? Uh, I Heard You Paint Houses. That's the book which is supposed to be nonfiction that the movie 
was inspired by, but it's a screen adaptation. So I, I, with the way I viewed the movie was this is not a documentary. This is not something that necessarily has to be true in all regards. So when I, I watched it, there were portions of the movie that when I watched something, I said to myself, well, I know that in fact didn't happen. Uh, but then there were other things I watched about it that I thought was, were enjoyable. There was a theme about the movie that I thought was really good because it, it reminded me of, in some regards, what my life was like representing the mob and representing mobsters, including Frank, during this time period after this mob war broke out. So th- if I could mention the theme that I thought was, at least I thought was an interesting theme in the movie, is how you have to trans for your life when you're in the throes of the mob and you're meeting people in the mob restaurants and uh, there's a whole world that's going on out there. And then you come home to your own family. And I had a a wife and two young boys at the time. And then you're going back into that arena. I mean, Frank was a client, for example, that never came to my office. And we were constantly concerned about surveillance, uh, wiretaps, either legal or illegal, because the backdrop of all this was the Hoffa disappearance and who was involved in, in that and uh, the government's uh, zeal in trying to prove whoever was involved and prosecute them. So this so, was the, so the government was spying on you. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that in some instances, you don't know for sure whether they are or they aren't, but you had to presume they were. So every time I, I talked on the phone uh, with Frank, we presumed that the phone was uh, bugged or wiretapped. Anytime we went somewhere, I presumed that, we were under surveillance, and we even had some codes that we used sometimes. So, for example, there were a number of restaurants we used to meet at. There was a number of places in South Philly and in the city, and then there were other places. And, and sometimes if, if I was going to meet him somewhere, he may say to me, well, remember where you had the veal scalpini or something? And I had a little bunch of things written down, so I know, well, that's where I'm going to meet him. You know? But the, the fact of the matter is, because of the nature of that investigation, and during this time period where I became, eventually became his lawyer, is that there was a mob war that broke out because Angelo Bruno, the head of the Philly mob, had been killed. And there were a number of people who were, during the course of that mob uh, battle, if you will, uh, that were killed. So this was something that on a you know, regular basis, I, mean, I remember Frank telling me one time, he, he was complaining that he was spending more money on mass cards than he was on wine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, now in the movie, on the other hand, the movie flashed up three names of uh, Philly mobsters who I knew of, and they had dates of uh, death, you know, when they died during the course of this battle. And there was uh, Frank Sindone, Phil Chicken Man Testa, and then there was uh, John McCullough, who was also uh, shot and killed. And they didn't say specifically in the movie that Frank did it. But when I watched the movie and I saw the names, I recognized the names. I knew who they were. I knew Frank was not the person who shot or killed any of the three. So when I was watching the movie, I was watching it from the standpoint of somebody who knew of these people, knew pretty much what, a lot of what the backdrop of what went on. And there was also the, another scene. Uh, so, are you there? So are you telling us that the implication of the, the movie was that uh, Frank killed these guys is that well i don't know because what happened was they didn't portray in the movie they didn't show him actually doing that but what they showed in the movie at least the way i recall it they would flash on the screen and they had the name of somebody or nickname or mob name if you will and then they had a date when they were shot or killed now they didn't uh they didn't portray that actually in the movie itself they did show him committing a number of murders though right i remember uh, there was one atrocity in in world war ii which which boggles the mind that besides the hoffa case which we can get into in a second didn't they show him killing joey gallo well they did that that was uh, one of the things they showed and when i saw that that was totally Uh, inconsistent with everything that during the course of my representation, I knew based on the FBI reports and various other discovery materials I got, not only representing Frank, but representing Lou Batone, uh, Ralph Natale, and having access. Who's Joey Gallo? Who who is he? And why, why, why do we know that that accusation is probably wrong? Well, the reason why I, I would have reason to believe it's not 
correct and it would be wrong is based on all the FBI reports that I've seen and also uh, more recent FBI interviews that confirm the ones from before uh, where the FBI has, uh, based on everything that I've read, uh, actually the the agents who were involved in that investigation and one of the uh, agents uh, who I happen to have had matters with and I, I have read interviews from, including interviews that were done more recently, have the specific names of who was involved and none of them, none of the agents that I know of reports that I've ever seen or have been aware of uh, have pointed the finger at Frank as being the shooter who killed uh, Joey Gallo. Yeah, so well, that, that, and that in New York, if you if you grew up in New York and that you appear know, around that that time and you live down there, that's a, that's a pretty famous. First of all, Gallo was kind of while he wasn't a huge, really really high ranking person in the mob, he was a pretty famous mobster because unlike a lot of these guys who were older, they would uh, not necessarily take the limelight. Joey was uh, very Joey was very flashy. Very, you know, you, you could see him out at, at the clubs at the time. And, um, you know, he, he gets killed. Where does he get killed, uh, Glenn? Do you remember? Uh, I'm sorry. What did you say in here? What you said? Yeah. Where does where does Joey get shot in the oh, time? Um, Umberto's clam house? Mm-hmm. I've had I've that's, where, that's where that's uh, where they reference it. I mean, I can tell you the following. All right. Is that there there's an agent, for example, who I've had matters with and who was probably from the very beginning up to and including uh, many, many years, the top agent who was involved in uh, the organized crime division of the FBI in the New York division, then transferred to Philly and was literally the agent who was a repository of a lot of information. And my recollection was that uh, according to the information that he had, uh, basically there was somebody named Carbon DiBiase, and then Philip Gambino, aka Fungi, and uh, who and obviously he talked was about part it. of the Gambino family. Yeah, Just, and there was a Joe Luparelli, was a getaway driver, and uh, you know, I guess the best way to put it, there was also somebody. I, well, I think it mentions Jerry Orbach, you know, the guy who was uh, uh, on TV, and apparently there's information they have. I remember like various specifics dealing with the Gallo shooting. Uh, that the FBI and the organized crime uh, guys from New York, who also were involved in Philly and pretty much were on top of all this, uh, they, at least in everything that I that came across my eyes, did not have Frank at any time as being a shooter. And there, there's well, one other is, thing I want to point out while, yeah, before while you, we're before on this you topic. Get to that. Well, before you get to that, Glenn, tell us, uh, yeah. people don't know, you know, you described, you know, you described Frank, but where is he in the, I mean, is he a mob guy? Is he a teamster? What's, where, a business guy, where exactly is he kind of in the, the universe of this mob universe in the 70s and 80s and 60s? All right, well, this is the best way to describe it. Frank was the head of the teamsters in the state of Delaware. There was one union, as, as most people should know, Delaware is like the corporate headquarters for a lot of businesses. There was one union, one Teamsters union in the entire state, and Frank was the president, the head of that union, that local. He mm-hmm. was a very important person, at least, with regard to any mob connections that he may have had because of the position that he occupied by being the head of the union. Uh, with regard to the Teamsters itself, It also put him in a position where he developed a very close friendship and relationship with Jimmy Hoffa. Frank was a very valuable individual on two different fronts, the Teamster front with regard to Jimmy Hoffa and also the mob front because he had a very close relationship with Russell Buffalino and he was an important person because of his position in the union. And the one thing I did want to point out is when I mentioned that indictment, In that indictment that Frank was indicted for in the very beginning, I was referring to, he was indicted for allegedly being involved in five attempted murders and then two murders, but not in any way, shape, or form as a killer or a shooter. And the same thing with the co-defendant, Lou Batone. He was involved allegedly with one murder and the two of them, which the two of them would have had in common. But in the indictment itself, it says, quote, Defendant Francis J. Sheeran wouldn't did arrange to pay Charles Allen money for killing persons. So the bottom line was, in the case, the first case 
the very first racketeering case that Frank Sheeran went to trial on. He was acquitted. He was found not guilty. And then Angelo Bruno was assassinated. I then tried Lou Button's case, Lou Batone, and he was also acquitted. Neither of them in either of those cases, based on everything that the government had as of that time, was ever claimed to have been a killer or a shooter. So the, the notion that Frank was a ruthless killer is contrary to what he was indicted for, what he was, what he was then acquitted of, and the evidence and the information that the FBI had uh, on Frank and what his role was in organized crime. The person that I was referring to, Charles Allen, he really becomes a key because Allen ended up becoming a cooperating informant making and made tape recordings of Frank and others in the Philly mob for over a period of four months and then came in and testified against a, a number of people connected to the Philly mob and, and, and elsewhere. So what happened is... Well, no, wait a second. The, Tell us a little yeah. bit about Allen. Does he, he, was, uh, he was basically a mob, kind of like a jack-of-all-trades, wasn't he, at, at the time? Yeah, Charlie Allen is really an important figure, and I don't remember seeing him at all portrayed in the movie itself. But he, he is, at least from my standpoint, in determining who did what and who knew what, a very important figure and character because Allen uh, cooperated with the government and they did something highly unusual in his case. He had been represented at the time by a lawyer named Salavina who represented Angelo Bruno and represented a lot of people in the Philly mob. And I knew he, and, and Sal was a friend of mine. In fact, when we went to uh, Frank's daughter, Connie's wedding, we both were at the same table with our family, with our wives. So what happened is Sal was representing Charlie Allen. What the government did, they had a secret hearing where they got a lawyer for Allen. And the lawyer they got was a former first assistant from the U.S. Attorney's Office. He then represented Allen while Sal thought he had a bona fide client when he didn't. So for four months or so, Allen was tape recording Frank Sheeran and a, and a whole host of other people and became a significant witness against all these di different people in the mob. And Allen, in addition which is something that I haven't seen talked about specifically, or I didn't see mentioned anywhere in, either, in the movie, Alan actually pled guilty in his plea agreement. There's a plea agreement uh, that I've seen and I have where he pled guilty, among other things, among other criminal offenses, to conspiring with Jimmy Hoffa to kill Frank Simmons and others. And that's part of his plea agreement. All right, so now hold Alan, on, hold all, on, just a, hold yeah. hold on just a second because this is all you know. We're we're kind of tangling it up, and you know a lot of all people right. don't know who all these people are. So, at the time, so half a major figure in the country can, can stop the country by you know clicking his fingers, gets indicted, goes to jail, gets out of jail, wants to get back into things in the Teamsters, become president again. And the man that's president then and pretty much standing in his way is Fitzsimmons, right? That's correct. Now, Fitzsimmons, the mob and the Teamsters are pretty much tied up uh, you know, in bed together, we'll, we'll say. And there's uh, some people who were, who were in the mob are kind of aligned with Hoffa. And, but then there's others, uh, and maybe the majority and the more powerful ones who are aligned with Fitzsimmons. And so that's this, this conflict that's playing in, in the background, which I guess the public finds out about when Hoffa disappears. Correct? Yes. So, okay, so now we're kind of caught up. So what, uh, so well, Hoffa the plot, to the plot has to thicken because there's something I have to add to that. Okay, is that, go ahead. Is that Charlie Allen was in prison at the same time as Hoffa and Tony Provenzano in Lewisburg prison. And Charlie Allen, while in prison. And Tony, uh, was, Tony Pro, you know, for people who aren't from New York or, or Philadelphia, Tony Pro, another major, major uh, mob figure. And is he buddy buddy with uh, Hoffa, or how does, how does that go? <clears throat> well, no, that, that one thing about the movie, they were very correct in that they basically hated each other's guts. They couldn't <laughs> stand each other. Right. And what happened is they had, a, there was a lot of bad blood between them. But what makes this, what makes Alan such a interesting character is the following. 
when he's in prison, he is hanging out with both Provenzano and Hoffa. And according to the information that I had, he was stabbed a number of times defending Hoffa while Hoffa was in prison. So when they get out, there's a point in time where they all end up getting out. Alan was sort of like a freelance mobster. He did work and things for uh, Frank Sheeran. He did things for Buffalino. He did things with Provenzano. He had relationships with Hoffa. And he was somebody who was involved in in killings, tune-ups, not with cars, but tune-ups where, you know, you tune somebody up, arsons. And he no, had come long... on, Glenn. Tell us specifically what's a tune-up. I'm going to go oh, tune. You know what a tune-up so, is? Yeah. No, but tell, <laughs> That's tell where you us. beat the crap out of somebody, you know, yeah. or you know, you tune them up. You know, like, right, that yeah. was a tune-up. So he, yeah. So Charlie and I had Charlie in all my cases. I had him on the stand multiple times. I had all the discovery that dealt with Charlie. I had this memo, the Hoffex memo, which laid out the government's theories early on, which was later declassified. But Charlie is this interesting character because he sort of floats back and forth be all, be, between all these different people. And when Frank was asked to describe him, uh, he described him as his barking dog. That's how he described Alan. And Alan, according to the government's theory, according to the plea agreement and everything, Alan was, had pled guilty to conspiring with Hoffa. And what, according to Alan, was supposed to take place, he was going to aid Hoffa in getting rid of Fitzsimmons and others. And the bottom line is that there was, I think in the, in the movie, I remember there was a car bombing that occurred up near the Teamsters headquarters. And there's a whole bunch of material that I've seen and read that deals with uh, Alan having some involvement with that. And uh, Frank Fitzsimmons wasn't in the car. I think his son was there. He, he walks away from the car. The car blows up. And then that begins what becomes this attempt on both sides to get rid of the, the other side. So there's a backdrop in the movie that is done very well, which shows the attitude that Provenzano had against Hoffa and vice versa. They couldn't stand each other. And there's certain things in the movie that are consistent with things that Alan uh, has said. But Alan also, and he's dead now, he, in his reports and, and interviews that I've seen over the years, with the FBI agents that were his handlers. There were two basic agents. One was a case agent named John Tam, who was the case agent in all these cases that I was involved in. And then there's a case agent, Henry Handy. Uh, they were the two who pretty much dealt with Alan on a regular basis. Now, that actually, Alan, that's him, a really, can we just take a yeah. uh, kind of a little segue? And, and I know we're segueing all over the place, but you know, Tam is quite a character. I mean, you, you dealt with <laughs> He could walk into yeah. a courtroom and, and pretty much everybody, even the judge, I think, trembled, right? I mean, he was uh, quite a... Well, I think the best way to put it, that there was no love loss between John Tam and me. We had a number of run-ins and battles. Actually, the reason why I'm laughing, because there were, one of the things that was in the book, in Brandt's book, uh, was okay. a reference to Tam being blanketed. So in, in the book, I Heard You Paint Houses, there's mm -hmm. a reference where uh, Frank Sheeran tells Brandt about somebody jumping from behind a bush, throwing a blanket over Tam and blanking him. And that's, that's the way that you send a message to let somebody know how vulnerable they are. And it startles a guy. And by the time he gets the blanket off, the person who threw the blanket, blanket is long gone. And Frank in the book is quoted by Brant uh, as telling him all that. And then Frank you know, said I something. can't imagine. I, I can't imagine Tam letting that happen without you know him pulling a gun out and shooting the the bastard. <laughs> I, I mean, well, that's what I'm about yeah. to tell you. So yeah. then Frank goes on to say after that he says that, that Tam came to court and called me a mf -er, and I just smiled. Well, Tam will tell you that that never happened. Henry mm -hmm. Handy, who's the other agent, will tell you that never happened. And Jim Moore, who's the expert on organized crime, who was like one of the four people involved in the monitoring Allen along with everybody else will tell you, tell you that it never happened either. So you can either believe, you know, the three FBI agents who were involved in all this, or you can believe whatever Frank was telling Brandt and whatever got put into the book. But that's just an example of one of what I can tell you are many inaccuracies that are contained in the book. Uh, but I, I can tell you, I mean, John and I had a number of run-ins during the trials. We had run-ins in almost every one of the cases that I had. And quite frankly, we neither of us uh, like the other. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more stories I could tell, but I don't want to 
take up well, too much get, time yeah, talking yeah. about Tam. Yeah, let's get back to so Fitzsimmons and and Hoffa are kind of and the the mobsters uh, behind them or associated with them are kind of you know jockeying back and forth, blowing up each other's cars or houses or whatever, maybe throwing blankets on federal agents and maybe not. And well, so if not if you that? not if you believe the agents. And under these circumstances, I, you know, let's put it this way: was well, one uh, of the few times you believe a FBI agent, huh? Well, there's other times, too. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point of this. If I can get to the sort of cut to the chase on the book, I've had five books written on, on cases of mine. And I've had a book. One book, for example, was written by Joe Wombo out in California called Echoes in the Darkness. I had another one that was written called Blind Faith by Joe McGinnis. There's another one that was written by Larry Schiller, Perfect Murder, who wrote Perfect Murder, Perfect Town about John Benet Ramsey. He wrote a book called Cape May Courthouse, A Death in the Night on one of my cases. Now that book, for example, was a non-fictional account. It's one of the few books I, I ever cooperated on. So that when you read that book, you know that when you read it, it's factually correct. These other books, including the one that Brandt wrote, I call faction. There's portions of the book that are correct, and that are, are truthful. There's other parts that aren't. And the difficult thing is when you read a book like that, Unless you knew all the facts, as you're going through the book, it's very difficult to discern where the factual information is sometimes and where something may be coming from that's not credible. So there's a lot of areas where Frank says things in the book. There's things where Brandt says things that occurred. And unless you were there, unless you were in the position I'm in, I'm the one who listened to all the tape-recorded conversations over the years. I saw the transcripts. I read the FBI reports. I was in the courtrooms for, for these events. Okay, so, so, now, I, so now that you've established your credentials, and we're with you here, so now what happens with Hoffa and Fitzsimmons and all these guys going back and forth, what then kind of take us through what, what happens? All right, well, eventually, and let me put it this way, Hoffa ends up disappearing, uh, and uh, July 30th, uh, 1975, he disappears. And for the first few days, the Bloomfield Police Department are involved in the investigation. And then it gets turned over to the FBI around August the 5th. And what happens then and uh, is the following. The FBI uh, prepares, actually there's a grand jury, and they summon a, a, at least a half a dozen or more people in front of a grand jury in September. And uh, everybody that I know of t took the fifth. Now, I didn't represent anybody at that point, obviously. One of the things that I do recall is in the movie, there was a scene where Bill Buffalino is played by Ray Romano. And Bill Buffalino uh, was related to Russell. And I believe he represented some of the people in the grand jury when everybody took the fifth. Yeah, now, in Bill the movie, is a, Bill is an attorney, right? That's... Yeah, Bill Buffalino is an attorney. Right. Okay. But the, now, now I'm segueing back to the movie because what cracked me up is I'm watching the movie and they show what would have been a courtroom scene in the Boffa case. And Boffa, or Eugene Boffa, was Frank's co-defendant in the federal case in Wilmington, Delaware, that I tried. And I was Frank's lawyer. He hired me on, on his next indictment. Because after he beat the first case, he got indicted about two months later. And then he hired me instead of Emmett. And I represented Frank then uh, in his case in, in federal court in Delaware from July 1980 on for almost a decade. I was his lawyer and also his friend. So I'm watching the movie. There's Bill Buffalino in a courtroom, and he's and they mentioned the Buffett case. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute. I was the lawyer representing Frank. It wasn't Bill Buffalino. Well, wait so, a second. You know, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, what we really want to know, Glenn, let's <laughs> let's cut to the quick here. Who played yeah. you? In the movie, who, who? <laughs> well, well, that's the whole point. I was they, nobody played me because I wasn't in the movie. In other words, you were uh, they got... you on there for about three seconds on a walk. <laughs> well, that's not well, no, not really. So actually, so what makes this whole situation for me, at least in terms of the movie and, and the book, knowing what actually happened and having been there for uh, these events. Now, obviously, I wasn't there when Hoffa disappeared, but I'm talking about. From my, my representation of uh, all these different people, because what the government had to do was turn over their playing cards. So I, had a, I got a chance to see all the discovery in all these cases. I got to, to hear and listen to the wiretaps and tapes. Uh, that's another thing, as an aside, that cracked me up. 
when I was representing Frank, I was listening to the wiretaps with Emmett in the first case and then Frank's second case. Frank had a tendency to stammer. If Frank was upset or he got himself all worked up sometimes, he, got, he, he would stammer a little bit. So what happened was we had arguments with the government over what was really said. So we sometimes typed up our version of a transcript. They had theirs. We tried to agree on what was said. Eventually, the jury would have to determine you know, what it was you know, that was said. So there's a lot of little things that I recall as I was watching uh, the movie or when I was reading the book. But I was so looking at both away. of them very differently because let's, let's step away. Let's step away from the movie and the book there. Let, let's since you've seen all the records, and, you know, and you know, all, if not all of the players, why did the FBI focus? Why were they focusing on Frank? I mean, why did they think that he could tell them, you know, did they think that he was the murderer or did they think? No, he was no, the no. What, what were no, they no. Here's what they believe. Uh, and the the memo I'm talking about, the Hoffex memo, mm-hmm. that memo came out, I think it was like January of 1976. So during my representation, I got actually, to see you it. Know now, what? You, should, you know, it occurs to me that, that maybe younger, actually a lot of people may not know what the Hoffex memo was. So if you can give us a yeah, little. Yeah, that's what I was about to explain. Please. The Hoffex memo was, was a summary report of the FBI's investigation up to and including that point in time, where they list a whole number of names and people and what role they may play, what information they may have, interviews they did, et cetera. It was basically like a playbook of the different characters that may have been involved to some extent. Now, they, in the memo, they weren't saying in, in this memo that Frank was a shooter. What they were doing is they were putting together Uh, different names of people in the memo, which speaks for itself and identifies different individuals who they may be connected to. And it's basically a summary of what the FBI knew as of that point in time. During the time period that I was representing Frank, I never saw anything in the discovery and I never saw anything in the information that I had that indicated that Frank was believed to be by the FBI a sh- the shooter who killed Hoffa. That was not their theory. Their theory was that he had information about the disappearance and of value, and that if they could flip him, if they could turn him into an informant, like Allen, for example, then they'd be in a position to get information about what happened but not that they believe that Frank was the actual shooter. When you're putting all this together, you've got access to all the discovery. Do you have intel people doing link analysis charts and time event? Like, are they doing full-on analysis behind this? And then as you put all this together, if you realize something that they don't, like, do you, like, I can't mention this because this might connect this dot and give them something on my client or of one of my client's friends? Or I mean, there's a lot of things going on here. This is complex. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Glenn Zeitz. He is a trial lawyer with a long and well-earned reputation as one of the best in the state of New Jersey, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the federal court in that region. He's been at it a long time and tried scores of cases, including one where he defended a woman whose house was threatened by eminent domain, ultimately to make the property accessible to parking for a Trump casino. That means Glenn Zeitz has deposed Donald J. Trump. In the end, his client got to keep her house. His career has been riddled with the cast of characters who might find themselves in trouble in that neck of the woods, to include organized crime figures and casino operators from Atlantic City to Philadelphia. Joining Pete on this episode as his co-host is our dear friend, best-selling author Jim DeFelice, who knows just how to draw the narrative out of a guy. Jim and Glenn are friends. So the witty repartee ensues. Now, I want to take a second to invite you to support our favorite cause, Save the Brave. 
You can read about them at SaveTheBrave.org. They are a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. Read all about them. Donate a few bucks to help them help some veterans who can use a hand. Again, it's SaveTheBrave.org. Pete and I both support Save the Brave with our time and with recurring contributions right out of our PayPal accounts. Scott Husing supports them too. He serves on their board. They do great work and we urge you to support them as well. And if you would buy a combat veteran a lunch once a month, come on, you'd do that. That's all we're asking. And you can set up a recurring PayPal contribution, again, right at savethebrave.org. You should do it. We'd also like you to support the Break It Down show on whatever platform you're listening to us. iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube. Please help us out. With a five-star rating and a positive review, you'll help new listeners find us. And we really appreciate you doing it. And we appreciate you listening. And you can rate us and review us while you're listening, which is a hell of a lot easier than executing a legal defense in federal court. Speaking of which, you're going to love our guest today. Joining Pete and Jim D. Felice. Here is Glenn Zeitz. Complex. Yeah, it's a very good question. Let me answer it this way. I had uh, access to actually two investigators. One investigator was a former Army Army Ranger who I used in Frank's cases and who was a street guide. I could send him anywhere and who had a lot of connections. And we had our own sources of information, our own investigative work we did. And I had a second agent who worked when we had the when Baffa was the co-defendant, who was a former IRS criminal division agent and who ended up working on a lot of organized crime cases. So we were doing our own investigations. We'd have the benefit of their investigations. We would then also be able, if we had what's called a joint attorney-client relationship with some other lawyers, to share information so everybody didn't have to go out and duplicate each other's work. So the best way to answer that question Based on our situation, we were developing our own information, but what they also had to turn over to us, whatever they came up with. If we decided we wanted to use something that we had, then we would have been obligated to turn it over to them, but we didn't have to if we weren't going to use it. So what you're saying is correct. So what goes on and what did go on is there was this uh, aggressive defense investigation that we were doing on our end. We also were aware of like if somebody was going to become an in, became an informant, and it happened in, in the Frank's case. There was actually an individual who started out as a defendant. His name was Bobby Rispo, and during the course of what was originally going to be his defense, and we were careful. We didn't I didn't share anything with him or his lawyer, so I was careful about that. He ended up becoming a witness against Frank in my case, and he got put in the federal witness protection program. So one of the and he was on the other side of the fence. He was on the management side, the Boffa side which would have been, if you will, the Provenzano side. So it gets a little complicated, but the (laughs) best way to put it, you've got a lot of alliances that are out there. Then you have mixed alliances because the playing field can change depending upon what happens. And one last thing I can tell you, which made it even more uh, strange and bizarre, in the very first trial, I'm representing Lou Batone, the head of 107. Emmett's representing Frank. Frank was aligned with Hoffa. Lou, who was my client, was more in line with Fitzsimmons, and yet they both were co-defendants in the same indictment and charged you know, with, with the same conspiracy, allegedly, to murder this big Bobby Marino guy who was a union organizer. So and the just bottom line explain, is... And just to explain a little bit there, uh, the 107 is, is in... Where is that? That's in Atlantic City. That's right? the biggest union. That's the union in yeah. South Philadelphia. That's the uh, biggest Teamsters union. You got so it. That's like the, the union. And so right. what was and going we, on here... But the government, and again, just to kind of you know locate some of the players here, the government has basically the North and the South in the Civil War on the same side in the case. So they're they're really kind of confused in coming up with the theory, their their case theory, right? Well, yeah, because you can see how it helped me. If I've got a client and Emmett's got Frank and I got Lou, and one of them is on one side of the fence with regard to the union. Like Lou was okay with Fitzsimmons, Frank was back in Hoffa. It, it sure is inconsistent with two people conspiring together to go do something, which is a racketeering act. So that is one of the issues that you have to look at. So what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to, to say is that in answer to the question I just had, we had our own aggressive defense investigation because there's a lot of lying 
cheating, perjury that goes on. Because the one thing you have to understand, in order to survive in the mob, in order to get to the top of the heap and not end up like, you know, in a body bag somewhere, you have to learn how to lie and you have to learn how to survive on the street. And that is a test of how well you can conduct yourself, you know, how you handle yourself, whether you're going to move up the, it's like moving up a corporate ladder in some ways. And a lot of, there was a lot of bodies, a body count that went on, you know, during this uh, mob war and while things, you know, were shaking out. So the best testament to Frank's ability with his street smarts is he died a natural death. I mean, you got to say that about him. You know, he had great street smarts. Now, he's really good at lying, as you just said. How do you know he wasn't lying to you? Well, first of all, when you say lying to me, I- I'm not going to discuss like, specifically anything that Frank said to me Well, how do you, uh, yeah, let's, yeah, at the I, moment. I, I but let me say the following. All right. let, let, how do you, let, how let me, you judge whether a client is lying to you or being honest? I mean, how did, take us through that. All right. Well, it, 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 first of all, it varies from case to case and client to client. You have to understand something. In, in Frank's case, is the very first case he took the stand against uh, Emmett's advice, he ended up getting acquitted. He took the stand in my case and testified under oath in my case. He had a third trial in the state of Delaware. I think he, I'm pretty sure he testified in that one, but I can't say 100% for sure. So when you say, you know, how do you know someone's not lying or not? You as a lawyer cannot do the following. You can't suborn perjury on the stand. You can't knowingly put somebody in a stand and have them knowingly lie. But you can't do that. On the other hand, you have a right to, and a client has a right to tell their version of events and what they believe to be the truth. Now, you can only do so much. Now, you, you as a lawyer, you know, you're not there when this happened. I mean, you're, you know, when, when certain things occurred. So you do your own investigation. The client gets on the stand. They tell their version of the events as they contend that it happened. And then you see what happens. So, and then the jury makes a decision with regard to credibility. So that's pretty much the way it shakes out. And then so you what never, happens, have you ever mm-hmm. told a client, uh, stop bullshitting me? <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and there's a rule that deals with this ethically that lawyers are all governed by. And it's very basic because they, they, they were, the, the courts have always been concerned. Well, what happens with a lawyer if he has a client? The client says, look, I want to lie on the stand or <laughs> let's put up a phony alibi or something like that. Right. right. So here's the way it works. They were trying to figure out ethically. What do you do? A lawyer cannot knowingly participate in a fraud. A lawyer cannot put a client on and suborn perjury. So if your client says to you, look, I didn't do it, and all the evidence looks like they did, you can't take it upon yourself to make a judgment call and say, well, you know what, I think they probably did it, and then not allow them to tell their version of the events. So they have a right to do that. Now, if it turns out that you really know that someone's lying, and they say to you, I'm going to lie, and I'm going to get on the stand and lie my ass off and try to get acquitted, then what the rules say is the following. You can put the client on the stand, but you can't help them and assist them like in a normal question and answer fashion where you would normally ask a question and you go back and forth for however long it would take. You simply can put them on the stand and just say to them, tell the jury what it is that you claim happened, like in a narration. But you can't aid them in any perjurious testimony. You can't aid them in any way to commit a fraud on the court because you're also an officer of the court. So that's the way in which you have to conduct yourself. But you can't be the judge, jury, and executioner with your client and think that you're smarter than everybody and you know what actually happened because, you know, unless you're there, you know, how do you really know what happened in many of these cases? You know, you're relying and, on whatever information you have, and it's for the jury to sort of decide who's telling the, the truth. Hoffa case, and, and in the Hoffa case, the government never charged sheer, anyone, really, with, with Hoffa's uh, kidnapping or murder, right? Am I correct? No. No, the only person to my knowledge, that ever pled guilty or entered into a plea agreement that dealt with anything that would be Hoffa related was when Charlie Allen pled guilty to conspiring with Hoffa to kill, it was, I think, Frank Fitzsimmons and others. It's specifically in the plea agreement. I'd have to read the exact language and others. And basically, that is what formed the basis of what the government believes happened and what the motivation was for all this. So the government thinks 
Hoffa wanted uh, one side wanted Fitzsimmons and and uh, you know Provenzano and maybe some other people killed. Those guys got wind of it and said, "The hell with that. We're going to kill him first. Exactly. And, and, so, and so Hoffa ends up uh, buried in the Meadowlands in the uh, Giant Stadium. I've heard that. Is that the? Uh, well, there's a lot of uh, rumors that circulated over time about what happened. And in Brandt's book, there's a version of the events that is given and Frank gives. And then in the movie, the, the movie actually showed uh, in the movies, I recall a, a cremation uh, scene where the body is uh, cremated. So the, the movie shows that scene. And then in Brand's book, there's information about that being how the body was disposed of. But I'm not going to comment on that for the moment. I have to ask you, the title of the book is not The Irishman, which is a great title for the movie. And I mean, they don't really go into the fact that, you know, because he's Irish, he, he's never really a made man, but, you know, he's still connected because of the team spheres and blah, blah, blah. But the title of the book that the movie's based on is, what's the title about painting houses? No, it's called I Heard You Paint Houses. Okay, what what uh, what's that about? Was he a house painter? <laughs> well, no, no, here, now, according to the book, uh -huh. In the book, Brant claims and Frank, they claim jointly that the first uh, words that were ever spoken uh, from Hoffa to Sheeran is, I heard you paint houses, and that the paint is the blood, and that's the blood that splatters on the walls when someone is shot and killed. And then after that, Frank makes a statement, which so was a So that's a mob term? Is that, is that what, what uh, the implication is there? Yeah, that, well, the implication is that that's what that all meant, and it's sort of like a mob speak. But I can tell you the following, that the FBI agents who I have had my cases with, and I'm talking about Agent Henry Handy, Agent Quinn John Tam, Jim Moore, and the people who were involved in all these cases, and Charlie Allen and the mob and organized crime, if you ask any of them, they'll tell you they never heard of that phrase I never heard that ever used in any of the cases or any investigations they ever got involved in and that they don't believe it's true. In fact, I think Henry Handy used the term of already it's pure fiction. And I can tell you the following, at least I never heard that term ever or ever saw that term. I've heard, you know, somebody getting clipped, getting whacked. whacked. Yeah, there's work. It's a popular. Yeah. One. Yeah. So basically, there's a lot of different ways, but I've never, ever heard that or seen that in any of the 302 reports or informants reports or discovery or ever heard anybody even, you know, talking like that ever. And it does uh, have a nice ring to it, I have to say, though. Yeah, you know, it's a nice Well, there's also a sec there was a second part to that, though, because in the movie and also in the book, there was a, a statement where he says, and I also do my own carpentry work. And that was the second part of it, which... Everybody laughed, I think, when we saw the movie. And what's that, that was, supposed to mean? Right? And that was supposed to mean well, I also dispose of the body. I, I, right. That's what I, you know, I also dispose of the, of the body. So my basically, so the book would and movie would have us believe that the guy who's the president of a state Teamsters union was also a contract, essentially a contract killer, right? Is that what we're? Well, the I, I think if, if if you the bottom line, let's let's separate the two because the book. And if you take the book and then you take what Brandt has said about Frank in interviews and the book came out in three in 2004, then there was a change in 2005, a little bit of an addition. And then 2016, there was a large addition of over 50 some pages or more where he refers to stories that couldn't have been told before. Mm -hmm. And when you read all of it together, specifically including the 2016 addendum, and you read what Brandt says in the interviews that he's given, he makes Frank sound like, you know, a ruthless killer. Also that there's a number of bodies. I mean, I think I've read it. We're seeing like interviews where he's talking about like 20 uh, bodies or something. Or I mean like this, it's like, and what I was pointing out is that the sum total of what the government indicted him for on the cases uh, on the cases that I had in the very, very beginning, which included the tone and also Frank's own case in the heart of the indictment. It talks about arranging Charles, Charlie Allen, getting paid to either kill people, to kill people. 
it, it, so the government, I've never seen anything. So the in, government's in the theory is that he wasn't a, he wasn't a killer. He hired somebody else. But I, here's the thing, though, that I yeah, wait, wait, wait. But also well, specifically, no, second, no, hold on just a second, <laughs> because this is a memoir. This is, you know, we're, we're blaming, you know, we're blaming the book. We're blaming the movie. Da, da, da. This is what isn't this what Frank said? I mean, I mean, why would Frank uh, lie about that? I mean, what would his motivation be? Well, it's uh, pretty obvious what his motivation was. Well, not to me. What? Uh, well, his motivation was to monetize his story in the best way that he could. And uh, that was something that's a matter of record uh, during the years that I represented Frank and efforts that he made to try to do that. And there have been articles that have been written about it uh, in the past uh, with regard to uh, contacts, for example, with uh, Maria Shriver and NBC, uh, 60 Minutes. Also, other contacts, and there's articles I think Kitty Caparello wrote of uh, the Daily News and Stu Bykovsky, one of the local papers in, in the city, with regard to various uh, versions of the events and efforts that, that Frank uh, tried to make. And in the very beginning, when Emmett was his uh, lawyer in the very beginning, uh, there was actually a letter that Emmett wrote initially on Frank's behalf to Dan Moldea, who wrote the Hoffa Wars, threatening to sue him if he tried to implicate Frank in anything. And then there was a correspondence I had with the Reader's Digest where I had threatened to sue them once for libel and slander and everything. And what was going on is there were efforts all along for, for Frank to try in some way to monetize a story about this so, so he could provide so, for his family. So right, quite so he's frankly, trying to get money. Is that what you're saying? He's trying to make the story sound really sexy so that he can get money for his family as he's broke after coming out of jail? Is that what you're telling us? Well, that's a, a, a big part of the motivation. You know, let me just say this. God bless him, because I was thinking that when I was sitting there in the movie, I was wishing that he was, could come back for three and a half hours and the two of us could sit there and watch the movie and laugh our asses off and he could have some wine and I could be drinking a uh, Crown Royal with him because he ended up, as it turns out, hopefully, I, you know, from my perspective, I hope his family did get something out of all this because, you know, I don't begrudge them anything. I think that if that's the way it plays out and they got things out of it and they, and they can, you know, make some money and made money, I think that's great. You know, who am I to, you know, judge, uh, you know, that? I mean, from my standpoint, I look at the movie and I look at the book from different perspectives in the following way. The book purports to be a non-fictional, truthful account of events and things that occurred. The movie, to me, is entertainment, and it was entertainment that I enjoyed. I enjoyed watching the performances. I thought the actors were great. I thought it's a really entertaining movie. I didn't view it from the standpoint, when I was watching it, from the standpoint of whether or not something is actually true or not true, but I view the book in a different light because the book is representing the following. It's a non-fictional account of events that occurred, that it closes the case. And I think in terms of the case itself, there's two families that should be thought about. There's the Hoffa family and what happened to their loved one and who really was responsible for killing Jimmy Hoffa. And from the Sheeran side of the family, there were, there's the four daughters. And one of the daughters is Connie, who was the youngest. And when I read Brand's book, she didn't want to read the book. She doesn't want to believe these things. So on the, on the Hoffa side, there's family and loved ones who deserve to know the truth. And on the Sheeran side, the same thing. They deserve to know the truth about Frank. And the person that I knew and the person that's portrayed in the book and the person that ended up being portrayed in the movie is not the person that I knew. It's as simple as that. Wow, man, that's a lot. <laughs> That's a complex story. I almost feel like I need like a whole diagram to understand what you even said. When we look back at Frank's life, we're saying that it's just not as sexy as the movie portrayed, but we're hoping the, the family makes money like it's one last, uh, one last hustle. Before, no, uh, before no let, me, let me clarify. Let me try to clarify that if yeah. I can, all right? Yeah, please. Yeah, all right. When you say not as sexy, uh, let, let me try to make it, I guess, or clarify. Frank in many ways, was a man of honor. Frank never, ever would ever be an informer. He, he could have been offered the moon. We were in a position where all Frank had to do was cooperate. He never would have had to do the time that he did. He did his time honorably. He never testified or did anything to hurt someone else in terms of cooperating like what Alan did. He never shifted the blame. He refused to be a rat or an informant. He was an honorable guy. 
Besides that, he had a lot more to him. He wasn't like just some simple thug. Yeah. He had a great sense of humor. He, he, he wrote letters. And when you'd read the letters, that some of which that he sent to me, they were philosophical, as, as, as strange as it sounds they were in terms of his philosophy in life. Uh, he had a great sense of humor. So what I'm trying to say is there was a lot more to him as a person. And I don't have a problem with a Hollywood or Netflix treatment in terms of somebody, you know, with great acting, making a great story and people enter being entertained and enjoying it. So and there was something else I mentioned about the movie that I found that was pretty good. And that's the theme of what it's like when you're living a life in the mob. And then you also have a family because it shows the estrangement between him and his one daughter and how it bothered him at the very end and what it was like and how it affected him. And so that to me is something to be said for the movie and something to be said for the kind of person that he was and how they dr dramatize that in the movie. So I, I don't, I'm not comparing, I'm not taking the movie and treating the movie the same way as I would be treating the book. So I want to make sure I'm clear about that. I thought the performances were great. I thought it was really entertaining. I think that the actors were, I mean, the three actors are like of my generation were like, they were wonderful in their roles. So I guess, for one of a better way, I'm not treating okay. the movie in the same light that I would be treating the book. If you have a non-fictional account written by a lawyer and there's inaccuracies in the book, then I think it deserves to have a critique. If in you other have words, a movie, you would still have you, you would still you know have sit down and have a drink with De Niro. That would be fine. But of Brand, course, you would have of course, be, yeah, uh, of course, kind of because this, right. yeah, and I thought his acting was great, and I thought Al Pacino as I Hoffa, thought Pacino was Pacino as Hoffa was tremendous. I mean, that yeah, was, and Joe Pesci is Buffalino. I met Buffalino the way he, I, I met Buffalino, and and Pesci's the way he acted as Buffalino, and yeah. and the way that they showed the the drama between the daughter. And how she didn't like uh, Buffalino, but she liked Hoffa. The way they did all that, there was a lot of good stuff in the movie. I mean, the movie was really entertaining. I sat there for over three hours. And I, I have to say, I, I enjoyed it. I wasn't yeah. looking at the movie like, well, is this true? Is that false? And I was just sitting there enjoying it. Glenn Martin uh, Scorsese just called in and, and said, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks for everything. Yeah, there'll be a case of Crown Royal. My God, though, I, I, I have to say it. Uh, I, I have had a drink or two with uh, Glenn and never been offered Crown Royal. Pappy uh, Van Winkle, on the other hand. Well, can I tell you what I got? Let me tell you what happened. All right. In those days, I, I was drinking Crown Royal. Then I moved on to uh, Jack Daniels and various other things. And Frank liked wine. So when we were together. Yeah, it was what he drank. And one of the ways I got Frank as a client was also because of the lawyer who represented Baffa, who was a classmate of mine in law school. His name is Jim Schwartzman. He represented Eugene Baffa. And he, he also had told Gene, I guess, that Glenn is a really great lawyer. And then, so Frank, between knowing me and the fact I represented uh, Lou Batone and we got together and all that, the other thing I said to Jim, well, why did you pick me? And Jim said, the only lawyer I know that could drink with Frank. Huh. So that was the, that was what probably put me over the top that we could spend a lot of hours together hanging out and drinking together. <laughs> Who picked up the bar bill? I was Frank all the time. I'm the lawyer, remember? <laughs> it's you're such a great guest. I have so many things I wanted to say and I wanted to throw a Canadian mist joke in there, but everything you're saying is just so wonderful and rich. I, I couldn't bear to break in. I want to ask one last question. Frank's been dead. Gosh, it'll be 20 years here before we know it. Why are you so attached to his story still? I mean, how many dead clients do you represent like this? You know. Well, Frank uh, died in December of 2003. So I can tell you the following. I actually went to uh, the funeral home to say my goodbye. So let me tell you why I'm so attached and why I kept uh, memorabilia and I kept things that go back all these years. Is that, uh, and it's going to sound really weird. But we became really good friends. And I was a young lawyer. I was 32 in the very beginning. And then I was turned 33 uh, in February. So I had two young boys. Frank used to write me uh, letters. And I used to read them and look forward to them. And he always signed them, your friend. He was somebody who, as a young lawyer, beginning in their career in the criminal arena, it was, at least in terms of for my career, I couldn't have had a better client. He taught me street smarts. I remember the first time I went to a mob uh, restaurant, 
I happened to get there like after he was there and a few other people there. And I was the idiot with my back to the door. Uh-huh. And I'm seeing guys and guys are like putting their hand down where their pieces must be. I'm thinking, you idiot. You're the only one who can't see who's coming through the door. So I learned a lot over a time period with Frank. I learned about manifold bombs. We had a driver, Irish Jack Flynn, used to drive the car when we were in court. It was his job to drive the car around a courthouse a few times. So if the bomb went off, we weren't in the car. There were things that Frank, (laughs) yeah. So the point is this, is that it was an exciting way to practice criminal law for a young lawyer, even though I had a wife and two kids. And I was in this whole world that I'd never been in before. I used to watch Perry Mason when I was a young kid, and I used to think it was one of the coolest things in the world to be a lawyer like that and be in a courtroom and everything. And here I am. I'm hanging out with, like, Joe the Goat, who's known for eating peppers, Nick the Blade, uh, you know, all these other characters, Anthony Mad Dog, Dee Pasquale. You know, I'm meeting uh, different people in restaurants and stuff. It was an exciting uh, time. I was getting my name in the paper, and it was helping me. And and also, we developed a friendship. So the reason I'm saying this is that I have a special spot in my heart for him, and I kept paperwork and, and letters and things to this day because of the relationship that we had. And at the end of the day, I'm happy that he lived and died a natural death. There were things that happened along the way, which where I can tell you as an aside, I, I was called in one instance and the FBI said they wanted to meet me and Frank. Do you have time for this or not? Yeah, we got time for a story. about. All right, well, here's Frank what happened. I get a phone call and it's, it's, uh, the FBI wants to meet me and they want to meet me and they, I have to bring Frank. So I said, OK, so we'll have a meeting. And I said, and, they, and, they, and I said that let's meet me at the, uh, I think it was the Radisson Hotel in those days, back in Wilmington, Delaware. So I go to the lobby of the hotel, and there's maybe three agents there. I still, I still have a card from one of them, I think. And I said, let me see your cards. Who are you? And they go, where's Frank? And I said, he's close enough. That if you have something to tell me, I can pass it on to him, but not close enough that if you're taking photographs, they're going to be plastered all over the place, showing the two of us meeting the FBI, because then you're going to circulate on the street that he's a rat, and then we're going to have a problem. So then he realized this is a street smart young lawyer, right? So I said, what is it? They said, we have information as a contract out on Frank's life. I said, well, I want to know the following, who and why? And they said, well, we can't tell you that. I, and they go, now, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go tell Frank, but... You're not going to get any photographs. He's close enough. I can go tell him goodbye. So I go see Frank. And without going into what we talked about, the very next morning, I'll tell you what we did. We had a press conference in front of the Bellevue Stratford in Philadelphia. And we put it on the record. I put everything on the record with Frank and the media about what the FBI just told me, that there's supposedly a contract out on him, that he's not cooperating with the government that he's a bona fide defendant. We're fighting the government, and we intend to continue doing that. So I figured the following. If anybody was really thinking about hurting him or doing something to him, they now know it's a press conference. The FBI knows about it. We know about it. And you have to be crazy. And we also got the message out at the same time that he's fighting. He's not going to be an informant. He's not a rat. So don't think about that because he's not even considering that, nor will he ever consider that. So that's an example of what was going on in this time period. It was a dangerous time because people were getting shot, people were getting killed. And the good news is, is from my perspective, I feel good because Frank did what he did honorably. Eventually, I handled his parole in Sandstone, Minnesota, flew up there for him. On his 18-year sentence, on the case I had, he ended up doing the minimum, which was six years on 18. So he got out, he would have got out after one third, but he still had to go to Delaware on a state court case that I didn't handle. So he owed Delaware some time on that. Wow. So it was a long relationship with all kinds of work and we developed a friendship. And even though neither of us were Italian, we called each other Goomba. We were Goombas. Yeah. Well, I I think that's a lot. My buddy, Paul, who's Maltese, he calls me Goomba and, uh, and that's all right. I like it. So. Well, I liked it too, you know, yeah. and, and I, you know, in some ways it's kind of, I know it sounds bizarre, but he had four daughters and it was almost like he was in some ways taking me under his wing as a young 
lawyer, but he, who he also knew he could trust and who would fight tooth and nail for him, which I did. Man, I love it. What a great story. And, Jim, thanks so much for setting this up. I really appreciate it. And, and Glenn, let's let's have you back on to talk some more because I know once I hear this, I'm going to have questions and holes to fill in, and uh, I would love to hear more about these. Well, I'm only coming back and talking to you under one condition, ah. that we can talk about my Trump cases when I sued Donald twice in Atlantic City successfully. Done. You can do <laughs> That's, that's great. Got to I would be, love to that's do a that. condition. Preceding, I want to talk about my Trump cases also. Actually, when I sued Don for case. over six years for that elderly widow in Atlantic City and put a case on the books, an eminent domain, and he had to pay all my legal fees, and he also tried to hire me to sue Steve Wynn. If, if you're going to make a condition, though, really, we should be asking for some of that Pappy Van Winkle. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I want the 20. I don't want any of the 10. Bad. I want the 20. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We're for sure going to do the Donald Trump stuff just as soon as you and Jim and I can uh, uh, schedule the time and we'll get it out because what's what's better than that? I mean, you know, love or hate Donald Trump, you just got to love these uh, crazy stories that this guy seems to just draw like flies, you know? he just Yeah, well, I guess the best way to put it, it's a rarity to have a mob lawyer bringing an eminent domain civil rights case against the Trump organization and suing Donald individually and then being able to be successful in both cases, one, it took six years and put a case on the books that to this day is good law on eminent domain and getting paid. One of the few people ever got paid because I froze his money. <laughs> good for you, man. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Well, thank it was you. a pleasure. 